Um, right, OK, uh, tables, volcanoes, blah, blah, blah. Um, what, I, um, what I'm really going to be talking about uh, in, in some ways is um, why it is that when we make things, um, we, we have this choice between either making something or making anything. You know, and if we think of anything as the kind of things that you might get children to make if you gave them a, a bucket of clay, dinosaurs, their best friend, all this sort of thing, rather than the reproduction of standardised um, forms and artefacts that are fitting to the material that we're actually using. Um, I'm going to be using Hebridean Neolithic pottery, which is the subject of my PhD, to talk about it a little bit. And in particular, um, I'm going to be talking... Is there anybody get that a little bit darker? I'm going to be talking a little bit about, uh, in particular about the, the pot at the centre at the top, or at least that particular category of artefact, um, which is known as an Unstan bowl or an Unstan type bowl, I tend to call them because there's, there are variations within this. But it's the lack of variation overall which really intrigues me. Um, this isn't a real one, by the way. This is a reproduction. Or, or is it real? Ah, OK. Um, does that make it real? Um, feel free to have a look at it, but whatever you do, don't drop it, please. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in these because of the, the nature of variation within the Hebridean Neolithic pottery and within Neolithic pottery in, um, in Scotland, northern and western Scotland in general, and what it has to say about the variation in artefacts in general. Um, one of the questions I want to, uh, write, uh, to bring up as well is, if we're going to talk, put things into categories, if we're going to have taxonomies, what actually are categories in the first place? So, um, if it will work. Uh, traditional ways of looking at categorisation. Um, this is what uh, David Clark uh, would have called back in the 60s, uh, well, st we still do a monothetic categorisation of artefacts. Um, it's, it's kind of the automatic way, I think, that people might consider the way that we categorise artefacts, which is that they fall into groups, and we can define the, the boundaries between the groups, and we can argue about them, but that ultimately things belong somewhere. So uh, here are some examples of, of vessel styles from the Hebrides. Uh, a couple of them are named after type sites. The Unstan type bowls, they're named after um, uh, large mortuary vessels um, found in, in tombs in Orkney, which is ironic because most of them are not large not from mortuary context and not from Orkney. They're actually from the Western Isles, but that's, uh, that, be that as it may. The Acra Bowls, named after tombs in the southwest of Scotland, are also found in the Hebrides as well. Um, um, we end up with these supposedly exclusive categories. But unfortunately, the pots don't play ball. They don't really fit. We end up with vessels like the one in the bottom right-hand corner there, which look a little bit like the Biakara bowls at the top. But that vessel, although you can't see it very clearly on the slide, has decoration which is almost identical uh, to that seen on the Unstan bowl, as indeed to quite a large number of these vessels found, these shouldered vessels found in the Hebrides. So in the past, people might have called these hybrids which is uh, a phrase I really dislike. Uh, it, it reminds me of the, the, I don't know if you've ever watched The Mighty Boosh, but they have an evil hitcher character, a Cockney hitcher, who, who once, I remember, presented a song, it was a kind of Cockney knees up, Chasm Dave style thing in a techno style, which he just uh, said was the epitome of, of um, what was the exact phrase? It was elements of the past and elements of the future brought together to make something not quite as good as either, really. If people are taking elements from different pots, they're not just mixing them. Pots don't breed. They're doing it for a reason. So, no to hybrids. Um, there are uh, uh, other, other, other problems with this system. It's, it's essential, I think it's an essentialist idea that somehow there is something about these pots that make them go into one category or another. And it says that these, these sets are not overlapping. Um, and in a way, if you want a metaphor for this, you can think of it as like a mesa landscape where the, the, the pot categories or other artefact categories belong on the top. Of, of one of the mesas, there's nothing in between, um, somehow you've got to get from one to the next. Now, this model um, was challenged, well, a long time ago now really, probably most famously by David Clark um, in 1968, who put forward a model of polythetic categories in which pots uh, and other artefacts are, are made of varying combinations of attributes. But the attributes are not fixed, it's not all of the Unstan type bowls have some attributes and all of the uh, necked bowls, for example, have other attributes. They can share them to a greater or lesser extent, which means pots can be more or less members of a category. 
Um, there is no archetypal member of any particular pot category. That's why there's little white empty zones in the middle there. They have what, what the uh, linguist um, George Lakoff would have called degrees of prototypicality. They are more or less members of the set, but nothing is perfect. If you think of, of, of something else as, a, as an example, birds, for example, we might think of very prototypical birds, things like robins and blackbirds that we see a lot of. There's lots of them. They would be the dark areas on there, less prototypical typical birds that we see less of in this country, ostriches for example, might be a little bit further out and maybe there would be things that we weren't even sure if they should go in the bird category at all. An Archaeopteryx for example, something like that. Should it go there? Well to me it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm, I'm interested in why these uh, certain categories seem to be visible to us. I'm not interested in exactly what the nature of their boundaries might be. Um, and this I would compare to a volcanic landscape. Again, there's no peak to the these volcanoes, but we can have vessels anywhere on that landscape, on little coals and passes in between volcanoes, around the rims. And also, we've got certain um, types of vessel that seem to stand out. They're, they're very distinctive. Um, and in this case, I would say um, we, the, the volcano at the back there, these Unstan bowls, are probably, probably resemble that more than anything else. They kind of stand apart from the other vessels, which are more kind of blurry and difficult to put into categories. And that draws attention to them and uh, suggests that perhaps they've got some kind of significance, which I'm going to come to come on to in a few minutes. Now, so far I've talked uh, syncretically and <coughs> talked about just dividing up a big load of pots. But of course, archaeology has got a time dimension. And here, I'm, I'm still building on older ideas here. To, and you'll recognise David Clark through this one as well, um, if, you're, if you're old enough to think back that far like me. But um, what I've got here is a model of the, the little Unstan bowls, and I've got two examples on the left there, as being assembled from different combinations of attributes. Now, the attributes are not essential to any particular group of pots, and each, each pot type there is, has a little blue ring around it, bundling together the, the assemblage of attributes that forms this particular type of pot. But um, what's happening is that certain combinations of attributes are being remade over and over again. These particular assemblages are coming together. They're iterated. Um, it's a, a continuity. None of the pots are exact copies of previous examples, they're referencing, 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 oh dear me, you know the word I mean, <laughs> they're referring back to them and um, uh, they're citing them, as, as Sorensen, who you quoted earlier, would have said, um, but they're doing a job, so it's not essential for them to be absolute copies, they just need to be close enough. So the question then arises, uh, really, what is holding these categories together, these assemblages? Why is this being iterated through time? Is there some way we can understand what's going on? What are the processes behind it? What is causing this, what I would call cohesion? Um, Clark's term would be coherence to the degree to which these types have a, a strong family resemblance. But what's causing them to cohere through time? Now, I'm going to borrow a little steel, a little metaphor, unashamedly, from the Japanese archaeologist Koji Mizuguchi, who draws quite heavily on the um, uh, ideas of the German sociologist Niklas Luhmann. Um, incidentally, if you read Luhmann, be prepared. Um, he, looks, he makes Heidegger look like Beatrix Potter. Um, but, but his ideas are good, and um, uh, Mizuguchi uh, is, is actually, um, uh, several Japanese archaeologists actually make use of Luhmann. He's not hugely well known in this country. But, but Mizuguchi is very interesting to read on it. And um, the, the particular metaphor that I want to use here, um, Mizuguchi calls the walker metaphor. And the idea is that anybody that walks, or, or a walker generally, is defined by the way in which they walk. Slow walkers, fast walkers, careful walkers, clumsy walkers, and so on. And the things which condition and constrain the way you walk um, come from two uh, areas, really. One is the physical topography that you walk over. Is the ground easy to walk over? Is it rocky? Is it steep? Whatever it happens to be. Um, and the other is um, psychological. Um, so the different elements of, uh, of, of your belief system will affect the way you walk. So if you're walking through a dark, misty wood at nightfall, if you believe in ghosts, you'll walk in a very different way to somebody that doesn't believe in ghosts, but is fascinated by crepuscular wildlife. And so these, these two elements, um, what Mizuguchi calls the topographies of identity, lead to the way that you walk. 
And if we extend this metaphor outwards, rather, rather than limiting just to walking, the idea is that people are what people do. And groups of people, people that would identify together, and I, I would say identity is a process, not a thing. It's not something you have, it's a thing that you do. It is the process of identifying. It would come from sharing the similar expectations and dispositions that arise um, from a shared way of life and a shared environment with its topographies, its physical and its, its um, uh, psychological topographies that are constraining the way that people walk or behave in, generally, in general. Um, so, if we go on to the making of pots, I'm about 10 minutes at the moment, so I'm, yeah, fine. If I, if, I take, if I extend this metaphor a little bit and we look at pots, uh, we've, what's happening here is the process of making pots, which is analogous perhaps to walking, um, we've got physical and psychological elements to this. So a potter is drawing on uh, pre-existing prototypes. Maybe not um, reflectively, maybe they're not thinking particularly hard about this. Perhaps this is um, um, what Giddens would have called practical consciousness, just the intuitive knowledge of the way to go on in a particular circumstance that, that comes from experience. We've got the habits that are formed from <laughs> practice. Um, once you learn a particular way of making a pot, it's much easier to stick to it than to try and change it. And what would be the point of change, changing it anyway? The potter just knows what to do and gets on with it. There are constraints coming from materials. There are constraints of the function that the pot has to perform. Um, there's social approbation, which is extremely important. Nobody wants criticism of their pots. And so we've got this particular um, topography that is constraining what's likely to happen. Um, we've also got semantic salience, the meaning of the pot, what people take it to be saying, which is something that I'll come on to in just a minute as well. Um, and the pots not only look backwards to earlier forms and earlier practices, but they also look forwards as well to what comes afterwards. But they don't denote, they don't say precisely what they mean. Rather, they evoke, they, 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 they provoke particular memories and particular uh, ways of thinking and particular expectations. And the potter knows what these are, and the people that are using the pots know what they are. And even if they're not being explicit about it, they can interpret what's going on. Okay, so family resemblance. Um, <coughs> The Unstam bowls are, are, are rather odd in one respect, which is they, they, they do have this incredibly close family resemblance. 95% of the Unstam bowls that I have looked at from the, the Western Isles, and there's a lot of them, believe, <laughs> believe me there are, um, have exactly the same decorative motif, or very, very close um, versions of it. The forms are, are so similar. They're beautifully made, these pots. They're way for thin at times. And so something is constraining these vessels much more than the blurrier, polythetic things that I showed you a little bit earlier on. It's almost as if, to use a top, uh, topographic metaphor again, it's almost as if they are like a, a river in its upper course, tightly constrained by its valley sides, can only go a certain way. Whereas some of the other vessel forms are more like a braiding river. It's not got the constraints, it wanders all over the place, and sometimes it's very hard to decide whether uh, one stream is, is more important than another. And not only do we have the pots themselves as important in this respect, but the assemblages that they enter into as well. Worked clay, fire, milk, cereals, porridge. A weaning food with its implications perhaps for uh, increased fertility. And so we've got emergent properties coming from these assemblages. The same with work clay decoration of form with its semantic potential. Um, commensality, eating together, and the social possibilities that come from that. And even the way that pots enter together with archaeologists and theories in the modern world. Now, with, um, with the Onsten Bowls, one suggestion I would make that might help to explain this coherence, this family resemblance, is their role within commensality, within feasting. And I, uh, this is Ellen Donnell, or my, my photoshopped reconstruction of Ellen Donnell, a small islet settlement in the Western Isles, um, now accompanied by a lot more, um, being investigated by Duncan Garrow and Fraser Sturt. Um, there, are, there were vast quantities of elaborately decorated pottery at this site. Um, it's huge quantities of ash. It's in a rather unusual location, as you can see. It, highly unlikely to be defensive. You can paddle out to this. It, the water will barely come above your knees. And yet this was occupied for 800 years with almost no change in ceramic forms. 
Um, incidentally, I, I put this together for a conference post, and you always have to be very careful how you juxtapose images like this and your university's logo when you do that. You might give the wrong impression. <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, so uh, could it be that the semantic salience, the meaning of a vessel such as this, is so, f uh, is so important within meetings where people are coming together, possibly over large areas, because these vessels are found in Orkney, they're found in the Western Isles, they're found in Eastern Scotland, and yet in all of those areas, the other vessels that accompany them are regionally distinct. This is the BBC English of the Scottish Neolithic. It's spoken all over the place in addition to the regional dialects. My belief is that there was a significance to this which meant that the people from the, who were moving across areas that were gathering at these places understood very well. Um, it's almost a kind of badge of belonging, perhaps, for people that are, are travelling between one place and the next. And this is causing its coherence and it's causing it to stand out from the general variation. So we have a category and it's, bit, it's constrained by the particular circumstances in which it's uh, developed and used. Um, this all changed shortly after 3000 BC with the development of the, the of grooved wearer, ideas spreading from Orkney. Uh, my own suggestion would, the, would be that this is a rather belligerent society that's developing. How am I doing? Am I all right? <laughs> Good. Okay, you're being very kind to me, <laughs> considering. <laughs> um, uh, I think this is a rather belligerent society. Um, the Ness of Brodger in Orkney massive wall around the edge of it, uh, described by, well I'll be nice about this, but described by one of my colleagues as a gigantic go away wall. That wasn't quite the phrase he used. Uh, beautiful artifacts, but what are they? Axe heads, mace heads. This is, this is not a, a, a society that looks particularly at, at, um, at peace with itself. This is then spreading elsewhere. The reasons for that we can go into at some other time. But we've got a change in the topographies of identity here. Something has altered, new affordances are developing, and um, new material culture developing, that, uh, and a new categories developing within it. So to summarize it very quickly, um, the categories, they're, they're, they come after their tokens. They can't pre-exist. You can't have a category of pot with no pots to put into it. But they're not totalities, although they do have um, emergent potentials. Um, they could be, artifacts within the category could be more or less prototypical. They don't have to belong or not belong. And although all artifacts are unique, they do cite, they do look back to other forms, which leads to this um, family resemblance through time. Um, and we can look at the factors that are constraining it, which are things that archaeologists are particularly good at doing. Um, and of course, we need to remember that artifacts are only one part of larger, higher level assemblages. So my take home message is that taxonomies are processes. We're looking at iterative behaviours, we're looking at continuities of tradition, which the residue that we see behind um, then forms the basis of our own particular taxonomic categories. And I'll just leave you with a lovely little bit of Hebridean pottery for 30 seconds or so to finish off. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.